Hi friends, it's Dana here. Yesterday I read you a story about Marie Curie and how she find, found her scientific home in France. And today I'm going to read you another story about a scientist who eventually found his way to France so that he could study science in the most free way that he possibly could. So here we go. Let's read about the vast wonder of the world. It's about biologist Ernest Everett Just and it is by Malik. Melina Mangal and illustrated by Luisa Aribe. Here we go. Woods Hole, Massachusetts, 1911. At twilight, a man lay on a dock, luring marine worms with a lantern. He scooped them out of, with his net and placed them in a bucket. He couldn't wait to look at them more closely. He knew the ways of the sea, though he was not a fisherman. His grandfather had built wharves, but he was not a dock worker. His name was Ernest Everett Just, and he was a scientist. Ernest was not like other scientists. He saw the whole, where others only saw parts. He noticed details others failed to see. On the dock at dawn, he wrote poetry. Back in his laboratory, Ernest examined the marine worms under the microscope. He recorded and sketched their movements. How do their tiny egg cells create new life, he wondered. At a time when few expected a black man to do so well, Ernest became the world authority on how life begins from an egg. From early on, Ernest wondered about the world of water around him. Born in Charleston, South Carolina, where rivers and ocean met, Ernest watched how fishermen netted their catch. He learned how to read from his school teacher mother. After his father died when he was four, he learned how hard life could be. To find better paying work, Ernest's mother moved their family from the city across the river to the country. Soon after, Ernest caught typhoid fever. He survived, but he had lost his ability to read. He cried alone, struggling to relearn it all. Then one day, a miracle. Ernest could read again. He read as often as he could, letting his imagination roam. Words came to life as magical spirits. Ernest attended the school his mother created, in the town she also established. Ernest's mother never stopped working. Ernest never stopped observing, even while cooking, cleaning, and watching his younger brother and sister. He observed how a hurricane damaged their school, how tougher segregation laws restricted African Americans, and how his mother's remarriage changed life at home. What Ernest really loved to observe, though, was nature. Surrounded by rivers and ocean, marsh and mud, he found plenty to explore. At 13, Ernest left home to attend boarding school in Orangeburg, South Carolina. It was here he published his first poem, when he graduated, Ernest returned home, hoping to begin teaching in his mother's school, but a fire had destroyed it. Ernest left the segregated South on a steamship to continue his education up North. He dove into the new classes at a college preparatory school in New Hampshire. While he was away, his mother fell ill with tuberculosis and died. Ernest was stunned, full of grief and confusion. Ernest did the only thing he knew to do, return to his studies. He went on to Dartmouth College, working to pay his own way and to support his brother and sister back home. With less time to study, Ernest failed a class. He thought of his family and how they depended on him. He thought of his mother's hard work and belief in education. He had to keep going. Ernest took a biology class and his life changed forever. In that class, he discovered the microscopic world of a cell. Scientists knew that the cell is the smallest building block of life, but many had only a basic understanding of how the different parts of the cell work together as a new life developed. Ernest wanted to unlock this mystery. And he did. Ernest became a biology professor at Howard University in Washington, DC, teaching students to question and observe. Each summer, he traveled to the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts to research and experiment. 
Out on the collecting boat, Ernest looked for sea urchins, sand dollars, and starfish, and marine worms. He then carefully transported them to the lab in a covered bucket so the beating sun would not damage them. Most scientists carelessly removed the sea animals to study, but Ernest demonstrated that by observing living things in as natural an environment as possible, they could learn more. Ernest also taught scientists how to thoroughly cleanse glassware and equipment for the most accurate experiments. Using a simple light microscope, Ernest examined the egg cells of all those sea animals, night after night, day after day. While observing sand dollar eggs, Ernest noticed a wave of movement when a sperm contacted an egg. As slight as a shiver, it signaled an amazing discovery. The egg cell directed its own development during fertilization. This controversial idea went against what most scientists thought at the time. It wasn't just the sperm creating changes. The cell surface and the layer right below it were just as important at generating new life. Ernest published his research findings in many scientific papers. He traveled to conferences to share his ideas, and he won the first NAACP Springer Medal. As his reputation grew, Ernest's ideas caught the attention of scientists around the world. He was the first American research scientist invited to the world-famous Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin, Germany. From then on, Ernest worked in Europe as often and as long as he could, enjoying more warmth and respect than he'd ever felt in America. Despite his accomplishments, Ernest felt increasingly stifled in the United States. His family was not welcome with him in Massachusetts because of the color of their skin. He struggled for basic laboratory equipment at Howard. He didn't have the freedom white scientists had to choose where they worked. The time came when Ernest refused to tolerate the segregation any longer. He decided to move to France and become an independent researcher. Crossing the Atlantic, Ernest thought about the hundreds of students he'd introduced to science and how his fascination with cells began. He poured those memories and feelings into his work and completed a groundbreaking book. Through his careful observations and hard work, Ernest opened up the wonder of the universe to us all through a tiny egg cell. That's the end of that story, friends. Uh, the author's note is a beautiful note in here. Let me read it to you. Condensing Ernest Everett Just, Just's life into a picture book was a difficult task. I found his personal life beyond the laboratory as fascinating as his scientific legacy. For example, he helped a group of Howard University's faculty and student actors establish the College Dramatic Club, co-founded the Omega Psi Phi fraternity, and presented seminars in French at the Sarbonne, a prestigious university in Paris, France. To understand who Ernest Everett Just was and where he came from, I traveled to South Carolina. Born on August 14, 1883 in Charleston, Ernest experienced many hardships. Before he could walk, cholera, diphtheria, and tuberculosis killed Ernest's older brother, sister, a cousin, and an aunt. Ernest survived a number of natural disasters, including deadly hurricanes and the strongest earthquake to strike the southeastern United States. He also experienced a devastating series of Supreme Court decisions and state Jim Crow laws that denied black Americans their rights and created and reinforced separate and inferior spaces for black people on train cars, in schools, and in just about every other public space. During his early teenage years at South Carolina State College, formerly known as the Colored Normal Indust Industrial Agriculture and Mechanical College of South Carolina, Ernest's path to writing and publishing began. At the age of 15, a poem he wrote was published in Washington, D.C.-based newspaper. And while at school in New Hampshire, he was elected editor-in-chief of the Kimball Union student newspaper. When Everett was just a sophomore at Dartmouth College, he contributed to a chapter in Professor William Patton's classic biology text, The Evolution of the Vertebrates and Their Kin. After graduating from Dartmouth, Ernest was hired as a professor in the English department at Howard University, a premier institution of higher learning for African Americans. Ernest later became head of the biology department. He spent summers conducting research at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. 
Through success, though successful at Howard, he sought positions at other universities and instructions in institutions where he'd have better equipment and more time to work on experiments. No predominantly white American university would hire him because he was black and because he was outspoken about what he believed, challenging the findings of more prominent scientists. Ernest came to prefer working in Europe where scientists encouraged his unique approach to biology, which included both philosophy and science. Each time he cited the Statue of Liberty, he, when he returned from Europe, Ernest would say, this is where my liberty ends. Well, friends, I hope you found that very uh, interesting and very exposing of maybe some things that aren't so great about America. And I'm glad we were able to get over most of those things. And I hope we aren't stifling any other impressive and amazing scientist like Mr. Just here. Thank you so much for reading with me, friends. I hope you had a good one. Bye.